29 years old, by the time he's 17 and 18, he does not hate or fear or mistrust. And if you continue to bring programs such as this, not just at the church, but at our businesses, everywhere. This is a community. This is not a political section of town. It's a community. I agree. And if, lastly, if you can somehow figure out how we can address and talking with the greatest stockholders of our community, it is the business community. When the business community has a state at meetings such as this, they will address some of the concerns because budget cuts and federal cuts are going to impact some of the great programs that you are bringing to the community. You have to have another source, and that is our business community. They need to be at this table. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Chief, because he's here at the Wendell's Police Department, and I'm going to give him an opportunity in, sec in a moment just to talk about some of the community outreach that they do that I think a lot of folks are unaware of. But I can tell you, starting April 1st, the district attorney's office is going to roll out and adopt a school program. And we are going to start... Um, every quarter adopt an elementary, a middle, and a high school and have a program where we go to the schools and we talk to them about these different, these difficult issues and uh, talk to them about law enforcement, talk about the role of the district attorney's office and um, hopefully make some type of impact at an early age all the way through high school though. Someone said, you know, you need to just talk to people about elementary, middle, middle school. Well, I've seen as a judge individuals that are in my diversion program that were 70 years old that changed. So I believe Every individual is entitled to that opportunity, and every individual is entitled to have that, um, have someone that cares and lets them know that there's someone from the criminal justice system that's just not trying to prosecute them and put them behind bars, and that we, at the district attorney's office, want to prevent crime. We want to bring awareness to these situations. So we're going to roll out that initiative April 1st. So but thank you for your comments. Yes. My name is uh, Virginia Bradford, and I would just like to say from the statement, you know, from the judge that made so many of our young men and do fear and run from the offices because they fear for their life. They have been yes. racially profiled so much. And uh, I think the loss of the evidence of withheld and not presented to the DA's office, and I feel that if the proper evidence was presented, to the DA's office where problems could be corrected, you know. I know it's good offices and it's also bad offices, so we just have to, you know, go with the flow, but the, everybody is human and they should be treated human and not profile. I agree. I agree. I'm going to try to get to, I'm gonna get, get to everyone, but I also want to get to the cards. I'm going to do a card and then I'm going to come back to you next. Okay, here's a question on the, uh, one of the cards. What are your thoughts on the open gun carry law? What are my thoughts? Well, um, I mean, that's a... You better ask me what my thoughts are. What are your thoughts, Senator? <laughs> well, my thoughts are is that, um, that, number one, you shouldn't have open carry in the state of Texas. You have <laughs> however, however, it has... If you've allowed me to be a senator for the past 20 something years, and the, and the reality is, it's closer now to passing than ever before. Mm. Uh, it was passed out of a Senate committee last Thursday, and it will be taken up on the floor of the Senate probably within the next uh, 30 days. It'll probably be one of the first bills that's passed out of the Senate in the state of Texas. Let me just say this as, as a judge and as a prosecutor, I know that the number one cause of violent crimes are guns, it's a huge issue. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things as a judge, if an individual came in front of me and they pointed a gun in someone's face, those are the type of individuals that we need to look at. Maybe those are the types that need to go to the penitentiary. You put a gun in someone's face, you commit a violent offense, um, you break into their home and you have a weapon. Those are the things that we need to look at. Those are the types of cases that the, the DA's office needs to be actively prosecuting those type of cases. So um, I know that the number one cause of violent crimes is guns, so it's a huge issue. Very huge issue. Okay. Hi, my name is my name is Tammy Simpson. Um, the question you posed was, uh, what is the greatest barrier to trust that exists between the community and law enforcement? And one of the questions, or one of the concerns, I think a lot of people are afraid to address is no snitching, no snitching in the communities. I think that that fosters um, criminal behavior. It permits people to continue to have criminal behavior because they feel that their neighbors will not 
snitch on them, and therefore it doesn't enable the police department to do their fair job in bringing justice to people that have been um, uh, violently killed or uh, have some sort of crime committed against them. So um, I think that that seriously needs to be addressed because I think that without that, I believe I strongly believe that we can merge the two uh, cohesively, and um, it can be very promising if we just ditch. No snitch, it is insane, it is perpetuated by Hollywood, and if we can believe that there will be um, um, uh, consequences to people's criminal behavior, our communities will be safer. So can you address that? Well, I think that you have to look at any snitches or any witness that comes forth and um, is a witness to a crime has to be, we have to prove that they're credible. And that's something that we are, we have to do. That is our job. Because um, you cannot see justice if you have witnesses that are not credible. So um, that addresses the question. I mean, okay. Well, if you want, I want to make sure I answer. So ask what you're saying. Concerning African American males having higher bonds than uh, their Anglo counterparts, what are your thoughts concerning that? Well, I can all I can give you is my experience as a judge, and there is a bond schedule that we followed, and um, and a bond is given out by magistrates, and uh, I think that that's across the board that that's something that never even came into my mind whether you're African American, Caucasian. Latino is the same bond for everyone. However, there are certain things that we have to take into consideration when you are considering a bond as a judge. You have to you know, consider criminal history. You have to consider ties with the community, um, safety to the community. But uh, those are the only things that should be looked at. It should not be ever based on race. And it's, it, used, it's a, it used to be a bigger problem than it is now. I can assure you that. Uh, when I was a, a young assistant district attorney and also that of a defense attorney, uh, race was a factor in terms of uh, the, the amount of the bond, but now we've gone to a schedule. And frankly, we have a better judiciary now in Dallas County side. This bigger issue has, has been in the past. Now, sometimes you may get a different type of bond in a suburban community. You may very well get arrested in the suburbs and your bond ends up being higher, right, James? And then you end up having to turn around and get the bond um, because they run a bond and get the bond reduced. So. I think that's, really good. that's a good question as well. I mean, it's the job of the district attorney to make, I mean, our job is to seek justice. And it's a, we have the ability to either increase bonds or ask, well, file a motion. The judge is the ultimate um, decision maker in that, but either increase bonds or decrease bonds, or increase or decrease bonds. But as a judge, though, it's a different role. And I can just tell you from my perspective there, you just have to take these different factors into consideration. It should never be about race. I have a question in the reading. 
Hello, my name is Minister Dominique Alexander, President of the Next Generation Action Network. Um, I have been going across the country and throughout the state of Texas um, addressing issues of police brutality. And um, I've heard a few people say something about the different things of what we should do. Um, unless we go into the police departments and rechange the culture of the police department and actually encourage more community policing, um, and more police officers having a relationship or, or, or just with the people that they serve in their jurisdictions. Um, right now in, in these areas, it's not, it's not being addressed, especially here in Dallas. Um, I have uh, contacted police, association, uh, police associations, um, police departments, asking them to go back into our schools and educate our kids on how to interact with police. This is not the the, 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 the main focus of being able to do this, everybody want to play the blame game and make the people that's fighting police brutality think they're all against all different type of cops. And we're not. We're not. Uh, we know that, you know, we, we go by the slogan that my grandmother once said, said, one bad apple spoils a whole bunch. You know what I'm saying? And what we want to do is get them bad apples out of there so that we can gain the trust of our police department. But it takes the community to swallow each, body, each pride and say, hey, we're going to come back and we're going to, uh, you know, repair this relationship. And that's not what's being done. It's like a blame game. Hey, this person right here, this person not, uh, you know, interacting with police officers. But police officers are not interacting with the citizens. Um, I, I just want to see what, you know, uh, the DA's office is going to do to repair that relationship right there. Because that's what's needing to be uh, encouraged. More community policing and rechanging the culture in our police departments throughout the country. I agree. I agree with that. And I, and I can just tell you that you know, my, one of the first things that I first step when I took office 45 days ago was that we had a breakfast, uh, the district attorney's office had hosted a breakfast for every single police chief in Dallas County so we could start opening the lines of communication because that was not happening before. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to come up, we are not going to have solutions if we're not talking to one another. I mean, we all know that. And until we start talking with one another, then we can address these things and take action. And it's not, and I can say this, it's, I know that most folks think, well, maybe we just talk, talk, talk. We are going to come up with solutions at the district attorney's office. I promise you that. And that's why I'm talking to every single one of you while we're having these talk, town hall meetings and why I'm meeting with different law enforcement agencies so we can make sure we address it the right way. And um, as far we have Chief, Chief Aziz here with Dallas Police Department. If you want to come up, maybe talk about dress community policing because they Dallas Police Dallas Police Department does have some programs. I am uh, Deputy Chief Aziz with Dallas Police. Let me say a few things. I'm sitting here for Chief Brown, as you can tell, I'm not Chief Brown. <laughs> Somebody can tell them that I'm in trouble. Uh, I, I just, I'll just i answer a few of these questions right here. Uh, thanks uh, to D.A. Hawk for, and for Concord for having me. Uh, I would say that, let me qualify myself, I, I wear two different hats. I'm, all, I'm a deputy chief with Dallas Police. I've been here 23 years. Uh, grew up not too far from here in this uh, uh, Oak Street, uh, uh, Camp Wisdom, Oak Street, East, all that area over there. Town Creek is my street. Some of you may know about it. But... So, and I'm also, I wear a hat on the Black Police Association also. I came up from the lower ranks uh, police association. I sit as the national chair of the National Black Police Association, so, uh, which represents 110,000 black police forces across this nation. So I want to qualify myself when I say some things here, uh, that I've been around and I've been across the country, uh, and I speak on these issues uh, more than once, uh, from national media uh, to groups just like this. Uh, just two weeks ago, we were the mayor, National Black Police Association sponsored me with the mayor that talked to a group of young black men uh, with a young lady who asked the question about what telling these uh, young kids what not to do. Uh, and, you know, the National...